I'd like to call the order the November 25th meeting of the Dearborn Board of Education. Our secretary, Joe Guido, is not here tonight, so Trustee Shellis will act as secretary. Can we have a roll call, please? Here. Yes. Roxanne McDonald. Here. Amy Shell is here. Jim Schoolmaster. Here. President Adams. Here. Next item, please. The Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Yusuf Masalam, principal at Fortson High School, will introduce students who will lead in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening, President Adams, Board of, Trust <coughs> Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Whiston. It is my pleasure to work in close connection with our future school, Lori, and um, represent to you and present to you two outstanding eighth graders, Deanna, Leila, and Ali Alata, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The two students to come forward. You're going to sneak through here. Just don't trip on any of the wires. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Good job. You're welcome for coming. You have a good holiday. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Well done. Next item. Superintendent's update. Agenda items. For both agenda and non-agenda, I don't have any updates because uh, we gave you a lengthy legislative report last time. We have nine session days for the legislature to act. And so uh, hopefully, hopefully they won't do too much work. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for my report. Okay, next item. Citizen participation. Citizens wishing to address the board on agenda and non-agenda items for action who are signed in by 710 by submitting a blue card to the secretary may speak at this time. I have no blue cards. Okay, next item. Approval of minutes. Approval of the minutes of the following Dearborn Board of Education meeting. Special meeting closed. Expulsion, November 11, 2013. Board report 1360. Regular P12 meeting, November 11, 2013. Board report 1361. Um, recommended action. Make any necessary corrections and move approval of these minutes. So moved. Support. All right. Changes or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, we will attach a unanimous affirmative report. Next item. Recognition and acknowledgments, commendations. Um, Dave Mustanen will read our commendations tonight. Hello, everybody. Hi. It's my pleasure to be here to read the commendations. And we will soon be returning to our uh, student read commendations very soon. Starting us off uh, for the district commendations, we'd like to give commendations to Mr. Jeff Burek and Mr. Don Ball for their efforts to work with DTE and have power restored at Whitmore Bowles days earlier than originally projected. Uh, thanks to their efforts, we were able to open the school on Wednesday rather than the uh, original estimates of uh, Friday that were given to us. So we were able to get the students back in school. Now the students probably aren't going to give them commendations, <laughs> but we will give them commendations for, for taking that on and doing that. I also want to give commendations to 15 Dearborn Public School students who will be taking part in the Young Entrepreneurs Academy program. This is sponsored by the Dearborn Chamber of Commerce. These students come from Bryant, Fortson, and Dearborn High. And the program guides students through the process of starting and running a real business over the course of an entire academic year. The students will be learning how to develop, write, and present their business plans, plans to investors, and then those selected will be provided the funding to actually start their company. So this is kind of, if you ever saw the show Shark Tank, it's kind of a combination of Shark Tank and uh, a couple of other things, and it's a great learning opportunity for our students. And uh, like I said, there are several of our students who uh, are going to be involved in this program. This is an after-school program, it's voluntary, just something that they're, they, they want to do. Oh, turning our attention to Fortson High School, commendations to the students involved in the Fortson Key Club and their recent efforts during the Key Club Rally that was held in Wayland, Michigan. Students spent the weekend in interactive and hands-on workshops along with presentation workshops. They took part in a blanket brigade. They made cooling neckties and cards for soldiers. 
They walked for hunger and they learned about teamwork from Army soldiers and broke the ice with key clubbers from all around the state of Michigan. Special thanks to uh, Zainab Zarik, language arts teacher at uh, Fortson High School, and she is also the uh, key club advisor over there as well. We also want to congratulate uh, uh, seven students over at Dearborn High who uh, will be receiving $8,000 scholarships through Wayne State University. In addition, Wayne State uh, has awarded 45 scholarships uh, to Dearborn High students. So uh, as the year goes on, we start to see those numbers start to pile up and our students uh, can claim those scholarships. At all three of our high schools, actually, by the end of the year, we'll see, see millions of dollars, actually, of scholarship money going to our students. So this is just kind of starting that process off. They'll need it, too. <laughs> That's right. I, I speak with experience on that one with uh, a student in college right now. Yes, they will. Uh, over at Eunice Middle School, we want to once again uh, congratulate the students involved in their award-winning journalism program over at Eunice. Uh, the students recently took part in the Middle School Interscholastic Press Association Conference, which was held at uh, Michigan State University. Three Eunice students received top honors in writing features. Uh, writing feature stories and photography. So we want to say congratulations. Uh, first place winner in writing a feature story was uh, Amar Hamad. Uh, second place feature story was Zainab Hamoud. And third place for photo caption was Miriam Beydoun. And all of the students award winning work along <coughs> with all of the work that the uh, journalism class at McCullough Eunice does can be found on their online newspaper which is called The Living Textbook dot aaja dot org and we want to give special thanks to journalism teacher Miss April Kincaid for her continued dedication to this program and working with the students the program has been going on for several years now over there and uh, it gets quite a bit of attention not only locally but actually across the country and worldwide we've had uh, journalists from uh, other parts of the country uh, come in and visit the students and take a look at the work they're doing and it's a really great partnership that's going on over there. At Maples Elementary, we want to give commendations to the staff at Maples Elementary led by Principal Fatima Faraj who presented at the Advanced Ed State Conference. Maples was invited to the conference to share their three-year journey from being the, one of the lowest performing schools in the district to receiving reward school designation for the past two consecutive years. Uh, their sessions that they presented uh, showed, gave a roadmap on building a positive culture that consists of staff, parents, and other stakeholders. And at Becker Elementary, we want to give commendations to the team at Becker, who presented at the Michigan <coughs> Institute of Educational Management, uh, which is a Michigan Department of Education program, and their Fall 2013 School Improvement Conference. Becker was asked to present at the conference due to, the, to student success at the school, and they too have been named a beating the odds school uh, despite uh, all the several challenges that they face there. Uh, they uh, have shown that, uh, that uh, schools can continue to perform and perform at high levels. And that is our commendations. I for just want to evening. mention on both Maples and Becker, it's not that they submitted proposals and then were asked to speak. They actually were sought out by both of the different conferences to come out and speak because of the good work being done at those schools. So. That's really saying mm -hmm. something nice to Maple staff and parents and administration and Becker's staff, parents and administration, that they were sought out to present. So, good news. Very good. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Mr. Mustanen. Next item. Acknowledgement of donations. There are five. A donation of $1,850 has been offered to the district art department by the foundation to be used for the annual district-wide and citywide art competition materials. Donation of 1700 has been offered by the Education Foundation Foundation to Oakman School to be used for a laminator. Donation of $285 from the foundation has been offered to be used to pay for academic gains, trophies and certificates, and a donation of $1200 by the Dearborn Education Foundation has been offered to the Dearborn Magnet High School to be used for entry fees for the U of M State Challenge Team Building Competition and a donation of $17,933.80 has been offered by the Education Foundation in partnership with the district to be used by the music department for instruments and music materials. So 
nearly $23,000 in combination between the foundation and the district has been offered for these five items. So we thank the foundation and all those who make the donations possible. Thank you. Next item. Other? No other. Special reports, concussions, Mr. Brian Whiston, Dr. Glenn Laco, Mr. Abraham, Brahim Mashur. It's weird calling you Brahim. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, Dave is coming up to give us, the board had asked for an update on concussions in sports. As you know, this has been a, a major focus for the last couple of years in, in all of sports at every level. And so Abe is here to give us an update. I'm going to forgive I'm going to forgive our uh, lovely trustee for butchering my name. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's because I was reading it and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> you can call me. Yeah. Except on Mondays, you have to call me Mr. Mashur. But that's <laughs> I'll call you Good, Mr. good evening, President Adams, trustees, and superintendent, not only of the uh, city oh, of Dearborn or uh, right. the of local the area of the southeastern Michigan, but superintendent of the state of Michigan, Mr. Brian <laughs> Wiston. <laughs> Concussions in sports, oh, I'm gonna keep it coming. Concussions in sports. <laughs> um, last year, we well, worked with Oakwood Hospital and the Detroit Lions on establishing a concussion protocol for our district. Obviously, concussions have become a, a big part of the media and a, a big issue, something that we have to take a lot more uh, seriously because of the long-term effects of concussions. And I think it's something that was neglected for some time. I'm just going to go through a few things with respect to concussions. First of all, I'm not going to read the PowerPoint slides. I'm sure everybody uh, watching and everybody looking can, can read just fine. So, but anyhow, basically a concussion is what we refer to sometimes as whiplash of the brain. It's a shaking of the brain. Um, when, and it can occur in every sport. The first uh, picture here obviously is football, but we, you know, we have concussions in uh, all of our sports. Last year we had uh, five concussions in our district from middle school on through high school and actually only one was in football. The other four were one was in volleyball, one was in wrestling, uh, one or two, the other two were in soccer. So uh, concussions obviously can occur in any sport. And for us, we just obviously have to take a close look at any time we have a student that has a head injury. Uh, they can obviously occur in, in PE class as well. Some signs that we ask teachers and uh, coaches to look for, and obviously our trainers are all, uh, we only have trainers, uh, unfortunately, at the high school level, but uh, the trainers are all very well educated in what a concussion, uh, what signs of concussions are. And some of the things that we look for uh, when, when a child or a, a student athlete is hurt in any way, we, we, you know, first of all, see the level of alertness. How alert are they? Um, you know, can they answer questions? How are they moving their eyes? That type of thing. But a lot, a lot of times, unfortunately, with the concussions, the signs can come after the injury occurs. And that's something that we always have to keep in mind. Okay. Symptoms of concussions, and, some, uh, and by the way, the signs and symptoms are something that we sent home to all parents this year from kindergarten all through 12th grade. And just so that they can, you know, if they see any changes or whatnot in their, in their children, that they'll, they'll be a, have an idea as to what to look for as well. Uh, sometimes an injury in class, like I said, the signs are, the symptoms aren't there evident right away, mm -hmm. but they do show up two, three days later. So it's very important for parents to understand what to look for if their child has had, uh, sustained some kind of head injury. Okay, if an athlete is suspected of having a concussion, the athlete, we, we tell the, 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 the teachers and the coaches, when in doubt, set them out. We don't, not to take any chances and so on. Uh, there's a lot of different things, like I said, and, uh, that to, to look for, but at the same time, it's very important for parents to continually uh, monitor and observe and so on. Uh, as far as classroom teachers go, classroom teachers can also, you know, take note if there's a ch uh, student has been hurt to see if, you know, their, their work is suffering, because this is something that happens over the course of a few days. If they're sluggish in their performance, if they're lethargic in class, a lot of different little things that a classroom teacher can look for as well. Uh, basically, it's our job to make parents aware, to educate them, and to hope that, you know, together, obviously, we can work, we can find if, if this child does need ongoing uh, uh, medical attention. Like I said, our rule of thumb for all of our teachers and coaches is when in doubt, sit them out. And that's, again, that's just simply to, because it's, we have to be very uh, precautionary in our approach when it comes to concussions. 
Obviously, sometimes an injury can be more than just a simple concussion. If it is more serious, then it becomes a 911 emergency. Um, you know, for example, if, a, if somebody hits, hurts their head or hits their head in any way and they're, they're unconscious or they're in and out of consciousness, those are things that are a lot more than just a regular concussion. Uh, regular concussions, just so you know, the majority of them, um, over 95% really, uh, of concussions, they, students heal or you know, uh, people heal with time. It's, the time takes care of everything. It doesn't cause any brain damage. It's a brain injury, but it's not anything close to brain damage. Suffering multiple concussions, that's what we have to worry about, and that's what we have to keep track of, and that's what we are doing here from a central office uh, standpoint. So whenever a student has a concussion in the schools, they let us know here, this way if a child uh, leaves school or, or whatnot, we have paperwork to, to know how many concussions the person has sustained and whether or not it's safe for them to continue to participate in sports. Uh, so you know as far as our helmets go, we've replaced, oops, sorry, we've replaced all of our, our helmets uh, that are 10 years or older, we've replaced even some that are even 7 years or older, and the, the new technologies in helmets is better but they do not make any helmet that will keep uh, you know, people participating in football, for example, and, and, uh, from having concussions. There, there's no technology there yet. There may never be a technology that will prevent concussions. But again, the, the, uh, the new technologies that they're using now in, in helmets is much better, obviously, than what we had before. Just the amount of padding that there is, where the padding is placed, and that type of thing. But most sports don't use helmets. No, not all sports no, use helmets, and actually most soccer. Most sports don't. I'm sorry? Most sports don't. No, most don't. sports don't, and soccer is one that doesn't, and, and soccer, actually, there are more concussions in soccer than there are in football. A lot of people don't realize yeah. that, but uh, with the ball's coming at a high velocity, obviously, and people use their head a lot to, to, to hit the ball, so that's, uh, that's one of the unfortunate things, and again, there's no helmets in soccer. It's not Why mandated, so. Helmets? I'm sorry? Why not? I don't know. That's, uh, that's a good you know, question. It's just, when I we think, were growing traditionally. up, they didn't wear helmets playing hockey. You know, <laughs> they riding didn't. Bikes. And people had, riding you know. Bikes. Trying to get kids nowadays to use them riding bikes is hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. And kids are, yes, riding bikes. And, you know, I'd encourage people to wear helmets because soccer is one of those sports in which they're, you know, looking down. And so it's a... It's a collision type of sport. Absolutely. They're constantly looking down, and they aren't necessarily looking where they're going. Absolutely. No, it's a, it's a good point. And just like you said, in hockey, mm -hmm. they changed. Even in football, obviously, they changed the type of helmet that used to be worn from a leather uh, mm -hmm. you know, helmet to a, you know, one, one made of a lot tougher Well, even material. in baseball now, the batters all wear helmets. Yeah. And, you know, things have changed considerably since we were kids. It's a good point. Um, but anyhow, so if, some... If an oh, I'm sorry. If an athlete chose to wear a helmet in soccer, I'm sorry to even ask this question yeah, because my husband okay. would mm -hmm. be really annoyed at me. I should know <laughs> the answer to this. Uh, would th I'm assuming that they would be allowed to wear a helmet if they chose to. I don't, I, I, I don't know. I honestly, that. yeah, I honestly don't we'll know if there's a ruling an against it. I'm yeah. sorry. We'll have to get you an answer because yeah. I don't think we know. Yeah, I don't know that there's anywhere that says they can't wear a helmet. I mean, I, I would imagine it would be a specific type of helmet. I don't think they could wear a football type helmet or whatever. But, like in, in for example, in basketball, if somebody mm -hmm. has a facial injury, they are allowed to wear masks and so on to protect mm -hmm. their face if and they've broken are, their nose or you whatnot. You see, in professional games, there are professional goalies that wear a head covering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. so. Yeah. They'd have to wear a helmet in which they could see. In soccer. Right, right. In soccer, mm -hmm. but in soccer. In soccer, say, but, say, you know, no, you if they can do okay. it in hockey. Yeah. But they do have, like, a, a padding mm -hmm. that goes over the head mm -hmm. for goals. And hockey is very similar, I would mm -hmm. think, mm -hmm. because the puck is on the ground, and so you're constantly looking down for where I the action is. I think our hockey is. players actually wear helmets. For me? I think our hockey players Yes, hockey players, players wear hockey. Yeah, every, yeah, they're required yeah. now. Even yeah. the uh, yeah. professionals wear helmets. Anyhow, just to conclude with a couple of things, uh, the most important thing for someone who suffers a concussion is rest. Uh, rest, you know, allows the brain to kind of re rejuvenate itself and just, you know, let it settle back into where it's supposed to. Even mild running and jogging is, is not, rec you know, highly, it's highly recommended not to even jog or, or run or exercise in any way where, where there's bouncing and that type of thing uh, when somebody suffers a concussion. Obviously, plenty of sleep, good diet is always a great thing, and staying away from TV and stimulation, uh, visual stimulation is also important. Athletes cannot return to play until they get clearance from an MD or DO. 
uh, it's not something a trainer or a coach can say, okay, well, he's ready to go. Um, and, you know, sometimes coaches would say, oh, well, he just got his belt wrong, he's fine. Those are a lot of times are considered concussions. We can't just, you know, just because somebody seems to be okay that we think that everything is fine. They have to have, they have to be cleared again by an uh, MD or DO. The risks, again, of returning too soon are that prolonged injuries, um, you know, will obviously have a greater effect later on in life sometimes. Sometimes it's within five years, sometimes it's 20 years later. We just don't know. So the important thing is obviously to rest, take their time, and, and you know, before they return to participation. Reducing the risk, one of the most important things for us as far as reducing the risk of concussion, again, you know, obviously getting better equipment is a key. Another thing is education. Just the more we know, the more we understand about concussions, the more we can try to help prevent them and uh, prevent, obviously, their long-term effects, their negative long-term effects. A um, couple things. First of all, the law. The law basically says that it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that parents are informed, parents understand what needs to be done, and to raise an awareness. That's the biggest thing right now with the law. As far as we go as schools, again, we said, you know, I said uh, things we have to do is inform the parents that there was a concussion and then leave it to them to take their son or daughter to a, to a doctor and then they can be evaluated further from there. In very few cases, it requires more than just a doctor's visit. They need to do, you know, like a neurological exam and that type of thing. But for the most part, the majority of concussions, doctors can evaluate them. They usually let them rest for 10, we 10 days to uh, two weeks, and then they can return to play. And, you know, again, it's for what we try to encourage uh, or remind our student athletes, it's better to miss one game than to miss the whole season. Um, and, you know, to miss a game is, I know, important to a lot of you know, student athletes, but at the same time, you miss one game, make sure you have good, solid health before you come back, or even if it's two games, if it's a basketball season or a soccer season or whatever the case may be, uh, and then, you know, come back after that. So, and then it looks like David Mustin and edited my last drive and slide here. It says, unless you are part of the Michigan football team. I was hoping he was going to avoid that one. You may rather <laughs> just end your Moving season on. after making the <laughs> Moving on. I didn't even agree. I, uh, my, my advice to all the Michigan uh, faithful, just schedule more Division II schools to play. And you'll have a better record. But <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> Trustee McDonald. Now I understand why I didn't understand. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> we'll talk tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Trustee McDonald. <laughs> yes. Just a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm so glad to hear that we have newer equipment. I think that's vital. Um, there's a lot of strides all the time that are being made with the new equipment. Um, but I do know that uh, for younger students, concussions are potentially more dangerous than older students. Is there anything that we're doing, I know we don't have a lot of very young student athletes, right. but anything that we're doing um, to take precautions or to uh, let them be aware of some of the dangers or? We're, we're, again, we're communicating with families and we're, we're educating the, uh, you know, the, the parents when we sent home forms and so on that they were supposed to look at and sign and that type of thing. We speak about it as well in, in our PE classes because uh, you know, every student K-12 has physical education. So our physical education de teachers do a terrific job of talking about it with their students. There's posters, again, like I said, that we worked with the Lions in Oakwood Hospital, and actually the DMC was part of that as well, um, that uh, are in every gym in our, in our district. So, you know, so kids can continually look at it. And, you know, unfortunately, to some extent, people you know, start, everything became a concussion. It's like, oh, he hurt his head, it's a concussion. And it, there's a little bit of that. It's kind of to, ex to be expected the first year. But, you know, as people learn more and more about it, and it'll, I think, you know, level off where you know, when we report something, it's, it actually is what we say it is. But it is better to err in the same Oh, absolutely, so. absolutely, especially early on. The more, again, the more we know. And like you said, with younger students, it is, it, they take a longer time to heal, but at the same time, it's the same recipe. A lot of rest, you know, stay away from visual stimulation, you know, mm -hmm. proper diet, proper rest. Yep. Actually, the younger students can be injured on the playground. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's usually, where, that's usually where that happens. Yeah. Lunch recess. So we actually added wood chips, too. You can thank Jeff Burek and uh, mm -hmm. Tony Sarkins for that. They added uh, wood chips at a lot of the playgrounds to make right. it higher, more uh, thicker, so to absorb some of the fall of students falling mm -hmm. or whatnot. 
Trustee Lane, did you well, have a question? I was question? going to ask whether the students are trained in PE to recognize what a concussion is and to proactively tell someone. So, yeah. yes, the answer. <clears throat> I'm glad else? to see that or hear that you know, you've sent information home to parents because oh, yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right. <coughs> it may not show up for a day or two, and if they didn't know the student was injured, they might not be tuned into it. So that's great. Thank you, everyone. Any other Thank questions? You. Thank you, Mr. Monsieur. Next item. Special Education Department update. Mr. Brian Wiston, Dr. Gail Shankman, Mr. Michael Shelton. I think Mike has got his other two supervisors with him. And Michael, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Superintendent Wiston, President <coughs> Adams, trustees. It's our pleasure <coughs> to present uh, information on the Special Ed Department. Uh, I'm Michael Shelton. I'm Director of Special Education. And with me are two of our coordinators of special education. We have Mr. Clayton Birch with us and Ms. Lisa Horvitich. Uh, Dr. Joshua Tynan could not be with us tonight. He's under the weather. I think he had something to do with the Michigan game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going around. <laughs> <laughs> it's incurable. <laughs> we thought that a good place to start uh, our presentation is where we left off last year. Um, we talked about our teacher consultant support model at the elementary level. Uh, we have already realigned our staff to provide more support at the elementary level. This year, we changed their titles. They're no longer uh, titled teacher consultants. They are considered resource <coughs> teachers. Uh, that's what the model that we have at the middle and high school. It's really uh, more uh, towards the type of model that we've moved to, that supporting gen ed teachers in the gen end setting as much as possible. Our ancillary staff are supporting in the gen end settings as well. Speech and language teachers are now in our early L classrooms doing phonemic awareness, uh, articulation le lessons with our gen ed teachers so that those same strategies are getting done by the classroom teacher as well. Our social workers are in the classrooms. They're not pulling out as much. They're doing lessons. Um, I've had the opportunity to be at school improvement visits and other buildings to actually watch our social workers in action. They're doing uh, a lot of second step, which is some uh, character development, behavior um, uh, training that go with our positive behavior support programs that we have at all our schools and the teachers are right there with the social workers as we're presenting these lessons. Our occupational therapists are in the early L classrooms doing fine motor uh, strategies with our teachers. And our psychologists are now taking a bigger role in RTI or multi-tiered system of support. Not only are they recommending strategies, they're modeling them for the gen ed teachers. So they're kind of pulling up their sleeves and getting in there with our teachers as well. Co-teaching at the secondary level, Mr. Birch will talk more in depth about it, but we will continue to focus on improving the teaching and learning in our co-talk classes. We not only have worked at the secondary level, but we also are working at the elementary level, uh, particularly uh, Snow and at Miller School. So um, we are trying to improve student achievement in our co-talk classes. Certificate of Completion, we presented this last year at a separate board meeting. Uh, we've now uh, implemented uh, at the high school level, we actually have course titles, descriptions of the courses, pacing guides, and all three high schools are teaching those classes across the district. We are consistent. At the elementary level, our students actually have report cards, just like every other child. Um, so the work of Fadia, helping us develop the report cards. They have a different legend than uh, students that are on a diploma path. And uh, no longer are they getting a, if they're a fifth grader, getting a first grade report card. So we pulled out the essential element, elements in each grade level and now we're reporting on them. So high expectations for students that are cognitively impaired and not on a diploma path. And then we're improving our programs and services for our center programs. Center programs are for students that are moderate to severe disabilities. Uh, Lisa will talk about that a little bit more. But we have uh, done an excellent job of providing more service to center program students in our gen ed buildings. 
Uh, Michael Berry, uh, we're doing a lot of pre-vocational skills, not just uh, the classes that they have, but they're also uh, mixing in with the other students and other programs um, to Etzel Ford going over to Howe for field day, which was an awesome uh, thing to, to watch. So we're doing those kinds of things across the district right now. So that's kind of an update on what we said we were going to do last year. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Lisa to do our data portrait. All right, um, hello, good evening. Uh, you may notice from the data portrait, and I think you have a copy of that, um, the data uh, that's recorded is a year behind. So you'll see it looks at trends and the, uh, the latest year is 2012. So that's typically how it's reported. Uh, basically this sheet is looking at, or this slide is looking at the eligibility of students rather than who is being served in an actual classroom. And if you can see some of the numbers and some of the changes in the number of students in those different uh, disability areas, you'll see that there's an overall trend suggesting that some of the higher incidence categories, OHI, uh, specific learning disabilities, SLD, and SLI have decreased as we focus more on RTI or those multi-tiered system of support that Michael referenced. Um, so in general, we are seeing that the work we're doing with general ed teachers, ELL staff, intervention coaches alongside uh, special ed educators, um, all of those different staff that are assisting in providing a lot more service in has been helpful for students that might otherwise have, um, we may have waited till testing them or assessing them. So intervening early prevents some of these students from getting to the referral stage. Um, so some of the additional dec uh, decreases you see in the o OHI and the LD categories are a result of us coming up with procedures or um, a process for being consistent about how we look at those disability areas and um, trying to make sure the staff are doing the same thing or similar uh, things across the district. Um, some of our lower incidence categories, and you'll see from the numbers, have increased as we send less of our students um, to outside district programs. So this is the case with our, uh, we call it SXI, but it's severely multiply impaired and the severely cognitively impaired. So you'll see the severely cognitively impaired um, is impacting that uh, last um, area cognitive impairments has actually increased as we keep more of those students in our district and we serve their needs here um, and then also to some extent our ASD and EI programs are also impacted by serving more of our students in our district um, you may realize this just from seeing the news but obviously we've seen a lot of statewide nationwide increase in the ASD numbers that's a trend we expect to continue as well okay uh, Looking at the next data slide, we are in this case looking at the actual center programs. As Michael said, those are the programs that serve students with moderate to severe impairments, okay? And um, those are ones that greatly impact uh, the student's educational functioning. So the three special education coordinators supervise these six programs, as well as having additional responsibilities. Uh, if you picked up the handout on the, um, on the table, you'll see that all of our responsibilities are indicated on there, the buildings that we supervise, and also the staff that we supervise are a part of that, okay? So I'm gonna hand it over to Clayton. Nope. Oh, oh am I? you? Okay, I'm sorry. So we, just now started to talk about the integrated service model. Uh, we did not give it a, a title when we started. We needed to change the mindset of our department and our district. We were always uh, saying that special education is not a place, it's a service. What we were doing is uh, the integrated service model. It's really a takeoff from Peggy Black, who has been a consultant for us. Um, it's what we were doing. We've started to collaborate with the ELL department, the general ed department, and special ed. We have that 3D committee. And it's just wrapping around all the services so that we're not working in isolation any longer. Uh, we were very fortunate this year to be able to present at the state conference on the integrated service model. Uh, it was a great opportunity to us to share what Dearborn's doing uh, to all the special ed directors and supervisors in the state. 
two basic ideas about the integrated service model. One, that when we intervene, we do it with a purpose. We target the deficit and we monitor that intervention. It's not just enough to schedule a class and then start putting students into the class. Target the intervention, monitor it, know if it's hitting the mark or not, and we do this to increase student achievement. The second big idea is that, uh, that our teachers become learners of their teaching and students become their own teachers. So in our classrooms, when we do those uh, visits, you'll see many more small groups. You'll see more student engagement. They're doing more of the talking, less stand and deliver, and less uh, lecture and note taking. Uh, the Daily Five and Cafe helped do that with all the strategy groups and the model at the elementary level, but we're seeing it across the district. The, the big thing, though, is that now our adults are sharing with one another. They're learning from one another as they collaborate. That's the big idea. Uh, it's making a difference. They're learning from one another and uh, getting better at uh, teaching and learning. So why are we doing this? reach more students. We just don't do them one at a time. We have a collaboration of, of services and we have eliminated the wait and fail model. Students get the service they need as soon as they need them. So we're not waiting till they fall farther and farther behind. So now I get to turn it over to Mr. Birch to talk. He, uh, Mr. Birch has all our secondary schools, our seven middle schools, and our three high schools to supervise. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Um, I supervise the secondary programs uh, for co-teaching at all three high schools and the seven middle schools. As you can see with the data report here, our numbers for co-taught, our numbers of students in co-taught classes have increased over the past three years. and. Um, <clears throat> the reason because of that is that we, our motto and one of our biggest goals with special education is to provide more service within the general education classroom, like Mr. Shelton just talked about. And, and why we co-teach is to improve the collaboration amongst general education teachers and special education teachers. Um, one of the greatest benefits of it is that now students, there's a, a, a larger teacher to student ratio. Um, you have a content expert and you also have a, a person that specializes in a specific disability or um, um, uh, as a special education provider. They can specifically design a lesson or design uh, specific services for particular students in the co-taught class. Um, it's shared responsibilities and shared reflection. Um, now I get a chance to bounce ideas off of one another. Um, it's not just the general education teacher coming up with accommodations or modifications uh, within the general education classroom all by themselves. Now I can uh, effectively work with somebody else that has the expertise in this background and not feel like I'm on an island. Um, so the biggest, that's the one of the biggest benefits of co-teaching that we've seen with our, um, our general education teachers and our special education teachers. Um, understanding aims and we, we kind of stole this a little bit from our, our work at MACE over the summer and also at our uh, co-teaching conferences that we attended um, accommodations modifications and specialized instruction um, with accommodations and modifications we've done a lot of work um, in servicing our staff and explaining the difference between an accommodation and a modification um, a lot of times we think that we're doing uh, an accommodation and sometimes it ends up that we're providing more support than needed and it becomes a, con a modification, which means that we're changing the content expectations of, um, or changing the curriculum altogether and the content expectations. Um, when we look at specialized instruction, this is the key to uh, co-teaching. We're able to now provide more specialized instruction within the general education classroom. And um, that's the biggest goal of, of co-teaching is providing more specialized instruction within the general education classroom. Like Mike talked about earlier, we have not only our special education teachers in the general ed classroom, but we also have our speech and language, our social workers, our ancillary staff are pushing the services. And now there's less of a stigma of special education amongst all students. Um, the biggest, another benefit of it is that um, as a special education student, 
I do not feel like oh, I'm, there's no more having to feel like I'm, I'm different than anybody else. Um, I'm not being pulled out. I'm not segregated from the rest of my peers. I'm able to stay in the classroom and that now I can, uh, as a special education teacher and a special education student, I can learn just like everybody else can within the general education uh, environment. So those are the biggest benefits of co-teaching. And um, if you have any other questions, I'd be more than willing to answer. This was Dr. Tynan's uh, part in the presentation, so I'll try to do it justice. Uh, we started looking at uh, uh, certificate of completion long ago. We've had, uh, now we currently have 52 students that are severely multiply impaired and severely cognitively impaired. And we've brought back many of these students uh, from Wyandotte. We've had others move into our district because of our center programs. Uh, and we did that. Uh, typically they were on a bus for an hour going one way so now we're servicing these students right here in our district at the level and I think even better than they were in other center program um, our administrators and teaching staff have worked with a cohort uh, through Wayne County to have pacing guides in language arts and math uh, in the essential elements for these uh, students with low uh, incident populations now the COC has almost two different types one for moderate to severe disabilities and another for a more mild cognitive impairment so we're talking about the ones that are severe and, mo and moderate we're trying to get a program that's uniformed uh, we've really focused on elementary and we'll continue to expand this to middle and high school as we move forward we're uh, trying to have a comprehensive program for these students that are moderate from three, we have to provide service from three to 26 years of age and looking at uh, post-secondary. So as students get old and they're older and they're uh, 20 or, or, or more, we have to have other programs for them. This is uh, a real focus across the state right now, providing as much uh, functional skills for our students that are on a certificate of completion path. So we're going to show you a video, a brief video of why we're doing what we're doing. We think it's a great example. And I know you guys get tired of me. It's little things. Coach Peter Morales of the Coronado High School Thunderbirds in El Paso, Texas, makes no qualms about it. He has a favorite on this team. Mitchell, I need you. I need you to help me out with my coaching tits, Mitchell. Team manager Mitchell Marcus has a developmental disability. One, two, three. And he far surpasses everyone here when it comes to love of the game. He's this amazing person that our basketball team loves being around. Yay! Mitchell's mom, Amy, says he's always been that way. Mitchell always had a basketball. That was always what he wanted for his birthday. And because basketball is that important to him, on the last game of the regular season, the coach told Mitchell to suit up. What was it like to put on the uniform? I was very happy. I bet you were. Just wearing a jersey was enough for Mitchell. But what he didn't know, what no one knew at the time, was that the coach planned to play him. At the end, no matter what the score. You were prepared to lose that game? For his moment, yes. For his moment in time, yes. And so, with a minute and a half left, Coronado leading, but only by 10, Coach Morales put in his manager. And just started hearing Mitchell, Mitchell. But here's where the fairy tale fell apart. Although his teammates did everything they could to get Mitchell a basket, each time they passed him the ball, he either missed the shot, or like on their last possession, booted it out of bounds, turning the ball over to the other team with just seconds left. He wasn't going to be able to score. But I was hoping that he was happy that he was just put in the game. Could you have ever imagined what happened next? No, I did. I could not. Not at all. What happened next happened on the inbound. The guy with the ball there is a senior at Franklin High School, number 22, Jonathan Montanez. Uh, I just, I was raised to treat others how you want to be treated. Just thought Mitchell deserved his chance, deserved his opportunity. I think I'll cry about it for the rest of my life. What Jonathan did was yell out Mitchell's name, then threw the ball right to it, right there. One of the most memorable turnovers of all time. <laughs> it wasn't the game-winning shot. When the buzzer sounded, Coronado had 15 more points than Franklin. 
but Jonathan's assist and Mitchell's basket did change the outcome decidedly. Play any game with this much sportsmanship. Both teams win. Steve Hartman on the road in El Paso, Texas. I get choked up and I've watched that thing a dozen times. <laughs> uh, it's really what we're about. Uh, including students in our inclusive delivery model is good for all students, not just students with IEPs. Um, and what you saw here is happening in our own district. Uh, we can find examples. I talked to Chris. She told me of an example where she was giving out books and some child helped another child that couldn't select a book from I mean, it's from the work at Michael Berry and some of the things that we've seen there with, uh, with um, I hate to single out a couple, but they just stick out for me that um, when they were developing a car and they included our moderate cognitively impaired kids, I mean, you know you've done the right thing when you've moved to this model. So I have to say that I have to hand it to our general ed teachers, you know, with all the um, high stakes testing and meeting the needs of all kids, there's a lot of pressure. And that's why we've sent the message that uh, not just for our special ed staff, but our ELL staff, support our gen ed teachers is to the maximum extent possible. We want to be, because the strategies that would work with one group of students will work with other students that they're working with in their classroom. Whether the student has autism or a developmental disability. Those things work for all kids at some point in, in their teaching career. So we're seeing that with our gen ed staff and I have to give them a lot of credit. All right, my last side, I can't get to. We wanted to talk to you about where we're going next. We wanna to continue to improve our current delivery model. We wanna improve our co-teaching. We're continue to focus on that the teaching and learning in our classrooms. We are looking at grades, we're looking at data constantly, sharing that with our principals and our teachers. The two other areas that we'd like to report on next year when we come here are looking at early childhood programs. We know that if we want our kids to catch up, we need to start early. So we wanna look at early childhood and again, looking at programs and services for our 20 to 26 year olds that are not on a diploma path. There has to be multiple options for them. We've already collaborated with Michigan Rehabilitation Services. We're trying to get support with them and, and other uh, agencies to uh, have more options for those students that are, are not on a diploma path. So thank you for allowing us to present today and take probably more time than I was supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> Go with pride, though. that's good. Tristan. Any questions? So with the um, certificate of completion, is that, at, um, is that generally given at a graduation ceremony when they can walk with their peers? Correct. Or is that at age 26? I'm no, no, assuming no. it's at graduation. No, if they meet the criteria of 23 credits and, the, and we've already did a scope mm -hmm. and sequence of the classes, mm -hmm. they make note of that in the graduation form and they walk with a certificate of completion. But that doesn't mean they're exited from program. Right, I understand. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Trustee Schoolmaster? Not only are we doing best for our children, but we're doing best for society as a whole. You know, I've got a short tail relative that graduated from a shoulder program. He's retired this year after working 35 years at the University of Michigan Dearborn as a janitor. And obviously, this type of program allowed him the skills to be a productive member of society. And so, you know, we congratulate it. These are not throwaway people. And we do whatever we can for them. That's the next door we knock on as Henry Ford Community College. But that, that <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right here. In front. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Good luck. Next item. Fortson High School Theater Group, Mr. Brian Wilson, Dr. Gail Shankman. Yes, this is another report uh, asked for by board members. It's the first of. We will have uh, Etzel Ford and uh, Dearborn High feeder meetings uh, as we go through next uh, calendar year, but we're starting off with the Fortune Feeder Collaborative because uh, they're the furthest ahead. So they've been doing good work and they're here as a team to share that with you. 
Thank you, Mr. Whiston. Uh, again, good evening, President Adams, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Whiston. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to, I have a yeah, large, large group team. of members from the team. Um, you will see we have a large team, part of the Forts and Feeder collaboration. And I just wanna introduce everyone real quick. We're gonna go from uh, your left to right. Mona Jalul from Woodworth Middle School. Kelly Herrick uh, from Forts and High School. Miriam Farhat from McDonald Elementary. Amy Keith, the uh, literacy coordinator. Uh, Terry Fitel, the numeracy coordinator. And uh, Hiyama Kadre, principal, as you all know, from uh, McCulley Eunice. And I have to be careful there because I always call Amy Terry and Terry Amy, so I have to make sure <laughs> I did it correct. I got it right this time. <laughs> and I asked, um, we, we got together and we wanted to make sure that there was representation from each of the areas and we, we wanted to bring somebody from every feeder school, but then we would have had about 30 people here and we didn't want to do that. But um, the Forts and Feeder collaboration, it, just to start out, it, it, it started, basically the things that we're gonna talk about today are things that have been happening before the collaboration even began. And when we, put, when we got together and you know, started this program, it was to streamline what is happening so that more can happen on a systemic and systematic basis. And by streamlining different um, strategies, uh, foundations for learning, the co-teaching, I mean, Mike, you know, segued perfectly into this, um, is to ensure that all the schools that feed at Fortson are working hand in hand and together so that we can create the most opportunities for our students. And I do want to preface and say, you know, what we're doing is not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all the problems. But the conversations are crucial, and those conversations have led to many uh, advancements beyond where we were just because we have teachers in a room talking with one another. Um, so through the Forts and Feeder collaboration, you know, the second slide real quick, these, these are the individuals that were representing the schools in the first meeting of uh, this year. And the idea behind it grew actually from general uh, administrative meetings, secondary principals meetings, and the elementary principals meetings. A few years ago, it started out where we as ad administrators were getting together uh, during our um, monthly meetings and talking about what are we doing, looking at data, what's working, what's not working, how can we streamline different things. About a year and a half ago, we sat down as a Forts and Feeder group and we said, hey, you know, let's, let's establish you know, a few meetings a year where we can bring people from our schools to have these conversations. So it's not just the principals and assistant principals and the coordinators, but the resource teachers and the teachers. So about a year and a half ago, we agreed to do that. And we started the conversations. And part of the conversations started out mostly with administrators and coordinators, I'm sorry, administrators, coordinators, and um, resource teachers to look at data and to have a discussion of the things that were working for each school and to compare the data from the MEEP and the MME as well as the ACT to see how that data aligned and to see where the gaps were when the students went from elementary to middle, middle to high school. So with this last year, we took it even a step further and we took that data, we took the information and this year, our first meeting, which was in November, because we, we try to have three to four meetings a year, and our goal this year is four meetings. And, and we do wait to November because of all the testing. We invited several more teachers to this year's meeting. And honestly, it was, an, it was the, the conversations were the conversations that you want teachers to be having. They were having those difficult conversations. They were discussing, you know, these are the things that we're seeing happening. And the best part about the conversations were that the teachers in those conversations were focusing on the things that they can control. And that's always the key area. What can we as a school control when our students are with us? So prior to the November meeting, the findings we, we found previously, and the team will get into more detail the findings of now, was that in, our, in literacy, we needed to focus much more on comprehension and informational text. And when we have these conversations, we are talking about pre-K 
through grade 12. And even conversations about, okay, what are we, when we talk to our colleagues in, at the college, what are they telling us? And we found that a lot of our students were struggling with stamina and inference with this informational text. And, and a big part of literacy and stamina is our students need to be able to sit and read for a longer period of time and comprehend what they're reading. We also found, which was very, very, very much correlated in the writing, was the narrative and the expository writing in, the, in terms of argument, argumentative as well as uh, formulating an opinion. So with the literacy component, these were the areas that we knew we needed to have more of a focus on. When we looked at and when we discussed numeracy, a constant uh, item that came up was looking at the basic math skills and how our students, as they go through the levels, when they struggle with basic math skills, of course, they're, they're going to continue to struggle as they go forward because when you get into large algebraic equations, so on and so forth, if you're struggling with the basic skills, it's a foundation. And it was nice because, again, in, in, um, when I talk about staff culture, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. The conversations have been wonderful because there is not a blame game. No one is blaming anyone else. And it's, it's, a, it's a very collegial conversation on what can we do to prepare our students? What can we do differently and or better of? The other aspect that we found in numeracy, again, was stamina. And that stamina related to problem solving skills, when our students have to read and they have to answer a problem. And it's funny because so many things I think back to myself and I say, okay, as a student, I, you know, I still remember I struggled in certain areas. And, and when the teachers have these conversations, they start reflecting upon themselves as well. And that reflection also works when they have the conversation with one another. Another area that we wanted to make sure that we focused on was culture, culture and climate. We want our students to always be prepared and ready for the next level. We want our students to be proud of the school that they attend and the schools that they are going to attend and be proud that as a Dearborn Public School student that when you go to the next level and to understand that there are people there to support you and to help you. And as we go further in the presentation, there will be a discussion of the things that are currently happening as well as future implementation of strategies and or ideas to help with that culture. Because if you look, one of the things that, there are two programs that I really want to emphasize and that is the Hive program at Woodworth as well as the web program at Eunice. And also Junior NHS is at, I believe, Lori and um, Eunice as well. And with the middle schools and the elementary schools. And these programs all tie into the Link Crew program at Fortson as well as the NHS program at Fortson. When we first started these discussions, and please remember, a lot of the things that are going on now were going on before the collaboration. But what, again, the collaboration was helping streamline these things and make them more systemic and systematic. We have students through the Fortson Feeder Collaboration from the middle school working with elementary school students, from the high school working with middle school students and elementary students, and vice versa. And this has really helped students with the transition to the next level to understand that that big school over on Ford Road really isn't that scary or Eunice Middle School isn't as big as they think it is, and so on and so forth. That Lori is a big school, but it's a you know, great school. And that Woodworth is a big school, but it's okay when you go there, because when we, when we think about our, our children, you know, they go from several elementary schools to a lower number of middle, middle schools and then one high school. So you eliminate that fear, it helps in the classroom. So I touched upon it briefly, but the staff culture was also very important in this. And it's, 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 it's a great thing when you have the teachers and the administrators having conversations and there are no, there's no blame. There is not, no, so you don't have one level blaming the next level for the issues. But you have collegial conversations. And again, I'm gonna reiterate these two words that are systemic and systematic. Because by them being systemic and systematic, it creates a culture of change to assist our students with the transition. And again, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to answer all the questions. But what it will do, it will allow for those conversations to help us move forward. And there is a system of trust. The consistency, the collaboration, and the communication are very important. 
So in our meeting in November, um, what we did was we brought the, the, the group together and we asked them to establish the norms of the collaboration. And these were the norms that they established. And if, as you can see here, the four focus areas are respect, engagement, positivity, and having a focus. And through these four areas, you know, the collaboration will continue to go further as we move further to take you know, all the schools that feed forts and feed one another for that systemic and systematic professional growth to help our students with success. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Hiam. Good evening. I'm going to talk briefly about the goals that we established, the objective, and a little bit about shared resources. Uh, currently, all the schools create their individual school improvement plans. So what we thought of is, if you look at them, everybody's got different strategies and there's not enough commonality. So what we agreed is we were going to come up with a common feeder improvement plan. So that way the strategies will be similar across K through uh, 12 and even 13 in some cases, so that every, kids as they progress are gonna be seeing the same thing. And then ultimately our goal, of course, is the end in mind, which is all students being college and career readiness. And if we do that, we know we'll close the achievement gap, which is a big thing we wanna look at. <coughs> Next, we established objectives for our collaborative group. We decided a main objective would be the emphasis on common academic language. A lot of students, uh, are you know having issues with vocabulary and building that vocabulary so we all agree that we need to work more on academic language because we want them to make sure that they can read not only in language arts but in all their subject areas a second objective is common strategies for writing this would be something like six plus one traits another strategy is organizers Organizers are a uh, way of providing visual aids to facilitate learning and instruction. Examples of these are thinking maps and graphic organizers. The third objective is really keeping our eye on the data, K through 12, as Yusuf mentioned. Um, we want to determine by looking at the data, is what we're doing, it, are the interventions working are the instructional practices working? If they aren't, we, we know we need to change them. And if they are, we will continue with them. <coughs> Sharing resources. Many of us go out and secure professional development for our staff, so our conversation was let's get together with our, our funds and if we bring in someone, let's share the cost so that more than one building benefits from it. So they, what they do is they'll bring back the best practices and we'll have them again in more than one building. This PD will lead to common alignment of best practices and strategies. We want students as they progress from grade to grade uh, to be familiar with strategies. And what do I mean by that? Here's a story my kindergarten teacher told me. She went to introduce Daily Five at the beginning of the year and, sh and she thought, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this? Well, the pre-K students stood up and said, we know how to do that. We loved Daily Five. <laughs> so that's, you know, and we can give you stories K through 12 where if, you know, we're using a thinking map and fifth grade, it should be the, the same thinking map they're using in 11th grade. So that's what we're hoping to do. Thank you. Good evening. So we wanted to make sure that as a group we maximize the time that we have together. As Yusuf had, had mentioned, our goal is four meetings and they're about a half day long. So that's not really a lot of time given all of the, the things that we, we want to explore. So. Um, one of the questions was the goals and objectives, obviously, of our work together, and that was to prepare students um, that are college and career ready. We kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, following that data, K-12, is extremely important. Looking at effect, are, are the practices that we're using, are those effective? Do we want to continue those? Um, commonalities, 
among the school improvement plans again. And then articulation, I think this is really important between the fifth and sixth, and again, the eighth and ninth. And Yusuf kind of touched on that a little bit as well. Looking at literacy, which is really my area, um, what are the immediate needs? We needed to take a look at the things that we really need to address now, and then again, we'll, we'll look at this again, and how do we move forward? Um, so we took a look at the things that we are already doing, and then again, to um, get that laser focus on them. So one of the things we're looking at is comprehension with a focus on inference and inquiry. Again, across the content areas, across um, P through 12, of course. Uh, writing, again, across the curriculum, six plus one traits in PK through 12. And then the higher order thinking, um, explaining how they got the answer, inquiry and analysis. And Terry will talk a little bit more about that when she gets into um, discussing the, the assessments that are upcoming. I'm just going to talk briefly about what we're doing at the elementary level in terms of literacy. Um, we're several years now we've been using Daily Five and Cafe. So we are continuing to fine tune that hand in hand with our ICs in our building, um, providing additional support in, co with the gen ed teacher. Um, also, we've had several sessions on language and literacy. Again, that helps not only our ELL students, but it helps all students. Um, with writing, six plus one, again, writing across all content areas. And also, we're giving students a toolbox of strategies so that they can carry it on from what they are getting in elementary school and then carry it on to middle school. That way, they can continue to add to those strategies. They can just pull them out whenever they need to use them. Good evening. Uh, and to... Uh I'm going to discuss what we're doing uh, at the middle school level. As Mariam has just mentioned, uh, uh, we are building on the daily five and sixth grade. And with comprehension, we are trying to focus more on informational text, trying to align with the Common Core state standards, balancing the, uh, the informational with the uh, narrative text. Uh, we uh, are applying uh, learning and language uh, strategies, PSYOP language and, uh, and uh, literacy. Uh, we are using uh, the uh, close and critical reading, trying to uh, dig deeper into a text and providing texts with uh, uh, complex text. Uh, with writing, uh, again, we're focusing more on informational text, citing evidence from sources, uh, uh, posing uh, questions that require evidence, uh, students defending their answers. And of course, we are applying the uh, six traits of writing, building on what students have learned in elementary school. Uh, but of course, so if uh, in elementary school an opinion writing is, or a student uh, uh, has been introduced to an opinion writing, we, we introduce it as argumentative to prepare students for the high school level. Uh, and of course, with uh, inquiry and analysis, working on uh, research projects at the middle school level in preparation for the high school. I'm here to talk about the numeracy, and one of the um, one of the chief areas were the computation issues. And our basic skills are now being addressed by something we're calling SLOT, sustained learning over time. And what this is, it's a scaffolded um, technique where week by week, the levels of difficulty are rising. The students don't even realize they're getting harder. And before you know it, they're doing things at a much higher level. An example I can give you with the three high schools are, they were doing equations at the beginning of Algebra One. that's one of the topics. Well, instead of focusing all their attention throughout a whole class period on just solving equations, it all revolved around word problems and developing word problems. So their slot work became the skilly part of solving, but their main instructional part was on the actual building, writing, and then solving of the equations, which is the higher level thinking. Um, Forts and Deerwood and Etzel are following the same slot format as are our middle schools. 
Um, another thing are the higher order thinking. The majority of the Common Core state standards, they're written at higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, so our teaching has had to change. You're seeing a lot more teacher facilitating, a lot more student doing. They're working with manipulatives. They're doing a lot more activities in the classroom. We just had U of M Dearborn come and do a Japanese lesson study at Fortson, and um, they, they wowed the, the collegiate people. They were just amazed at what the Fortson students were doing, and I told them they could walk into any Fortson math class and see that this was happening all over. It wasn't just a dog and pony show. They really are doing this in the classrooms with station teaching, everything. The other thing is we're doing a lot more with um, the writing. The middle, um, even in the gym class, they're writing, writing all across the curriculum. I had to do a presentation at a high school and I brought some writing from Dearborn Public School students, and um, the school district was amazed and said that they didn't think their kids could ever write as much as the kids at Fortson were doing. And the topics were difficult. They weren't just easy little topics. They were much developed questions that required a lot more um, thinking involved. Um, at the elementary level, we're, again, as Terry mentioned, we're focusing a lot on the basic skills. We don't want our kids to lose that. We want to continue the practice on a daily basis. We also use the everyday math curriculum. However, last year and, and more so this year, a lot of elementary teachers have received um, PD on math workshop and implementing the math workshop in their classrooms. And by using the math workshop, um, it allows the teacher to set up stations in the classroom where she can focus more, he can focus more on the needs of the students or the group of students that they're working with. For example, they might need to reteach something to a student who's struggling or might need some more support. And at the same time, 15 minutes later, the teacher can challenge the students who might need that extra, they have a little bit more um, to challenge them so they're not bored or they're not um, falling back. We want to continue to challenge our students. So we're using a lot of manipulatives. Writing has become a big part of math. Students have to explain how they got to their answer. We're not just looking for this is the final answer. We're looking for the thought process, which brings in higher order thinking. Mm -hmm. And we continue at the middle school level uh, with focusing on basic skills. Uh, and uh, we have this sustained learning over time, the, the slotting of the lessons, uh, higher order thinking, uh, uh, incorporating uh, interactive lessons, technology, manipulatives, and uh, students are required to write. They're not only just answering multiple choice questions, they have to explain and analyze and show their thinking on how they figured out uh, an answer. Uh, of course, using thinking maps, uh, using the six traits of writing again. Okay, and um, you've already heard quite a bit about co-teaching this evening, so I'll keep this part brief. But this is the first year that co-teaching is part of the feeder school collaboration, and we're working hand in hand with the numeracy and literacy coordinators. Um, we are, of course, using the same curriculum in the COTA classes, um, making it accessible to students by differentiation and scaffolding of the lessons. And um, our goals are to continue to develop and plan professional development for the teachers involved. And we are interested in having visitation and development of um, model classrooms both within buildings and between buildings. And we are working on more conversation between co-teachers on best practices in their classroom, what's working for them, and how we can share that with others. Um, we'd like to do more visitation and um, more collaboration between the buildings to share what's working. Thank you. Now, one thing I don't know if you've noticed, well, if you, if you notice, all the organizers we have in this PowerPoint are all thinking maps. <laughs> so, um, and that's a topic of a discussion for a different day, but I'll tell you what, thinking maps are something that really does help all of our students. 
um, what you see on this slide is, is, is it talks about the initiatives. Now, there's sometimes there's confusion uh, based on what are strategies and what are frameworks. Daily Five and Cafe is a framework. Reading Apprenticeship is a framework. Uh, six Plus One Traits of Writing is a framework. Under these, and slots is something that Terry created. I want everyone to understand that. That's something that she created based on her experience. But when you look at these frameworks, under these frameworks is the focus of academic vocabulary, is the focus of informational writing, is the focus of thinking maps. And these are research-based strategies that work. We focus on scientifically-based research strategies. And the key for scientifically-based research strategies to work in any school is significant professional development that is sustained and is systemic in every building. And the nice thing with the Forts and Future collaboration is our ultimate goal is to have that common feeder program that all the schools are going to say, okay, under these frameworks, these are the things we're going to focus on. And we're already more than halfway there. And with the teachers involved in this conversation, it is nice because you're getting real anecdotal evidence, not just quantitative evidence based on data from the scores, but also qualitative evidence based on the perceptions of the students, the perceptions of the parents, and the perceptions of the teachers. We always say, you know, the teachers are on the front line. They're working with, you know, in elementary, they're working with 30 kids. Middle school, they're working with 150 kids. High school, they're working with 150 kids. So they're on the front line and they're working with these students. So when you look at these initiatives, this is the direction that the future program has been going and is going. And I want to reiterate, I think it's very important everyone understands, these things were happening before the collaboration. But the collaboration has allowed us to streamline more of it. A very important aspect of the collaboration to prepare our students to be college and career ready are the assessments that our students are using in the classroom. And Terry's going to talk a little bit about assessments and the direction we're going with that. Um, the majority of teachers' um, summative assessments, they're being rewritten um, to resemble the new test, which is going to be called the SBAC, which stands for Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. And these are going to be administered in the spring of 2015. Um, the new SBAC tests, they are really focusing on inquiry and reasoning, explaining answers. They're not multiple choice anymore. They're selected response, constructed response, extended constructed response, and performance tasks, and also technology enhanced items. Um, this is our second year of implementing SBAC-like common assessments um, through elementary, middle school, and high school. The kids are starting to get used to them now. I'll, again, as Yusuf said earlier, this all happened before our feeder collaboration, but having these meetings is giving us the opportunity to have conversations about them. So to conclude, future implementation. I mean, this is the key. We develop what we need to do based on what we have. We look at where we are, and we determine where we need to go. I mean, that's the only plan, the road, the, you know, that's, mm -hmm. and, it's very simple. We, we want to have four meetings a year. That's our goal. It, it, they're about three hours long, and they're, and they're very succinct and direct. The questions are, are, are established. The goals have been established. The objectives have been established. And all this has been established by the teachers and the individuals in the collaboration. <clears throat> we want to establish that consistency with staff across the board. We want that our kindergarten teachers and our preschool teachers have the same goal in mind as our teachers preparing seniors to go off to college. Now, granted, how a preschooler or a kindergartner writes an informative response may look different, and it should look different, than how a senior writes that response. But the idea and the focus is, is that there's higher level thinking under Bloom's taxonomy. And we are asking students to do more. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm lucky because of the experiences and, uh, that I've had here in the Denver Public Schools. You know, I, one of the best things that ever happened to me was I was a principal of an elementary school. I'm being honest, it was probably the best thing that happened to me in my career. Because it really gave me an understanding of how elementary, especially early L, really impacts the future of every student. And how when you walk into a high school classroom, even when you're preparing them to write for the ACT, the things that they do in the kindergarten classroom 
does prepare them for that 11th grade year. And I can give you several, anecdotal, uh, several stories of anecdotal evidence, such as at a school improvement visit that I was at, and speaking with students, uh, the students saw my forts and sure, and they, you know, they knew who I was, and, and they were, they were work, one math class, they were working on slot, and then I went to a language arts class, and they were working on reader's apprenticeship, and they were talking to the text, and the kids are, you know, they're going, they're going, they're going, they're going. And one of the students said to me, Mr. Masalam, will we do this at Fortson? I said, you better believe it. That's proof in, in, right there that these conversations have to happen. The conversations will lead us to success because we're going to have difficult conversations at times. And these conversations are going to take us to a point where, you know, we may speak to one another and say, wait a minute. If, you know, at Fortson, we've been doing this for 10 years, or we've been doing this for 30 years, or we've been only doing it for one year. Does the evidence support it? And if the evidence doesn't support it, then what are the middle schools and elementary schools doing? And vice versa. And through these conversations, we can build a capacity for leadership. And they think this is key. And this is crucial. In order for our schools to continuously be successful, we must build capacity for leadership within our teachers in the classrooms. Every one of our teachers are leaders. And they're leaders with their students. And that leadership will lead us to have faith in the things that they're doing and to have those difficult conversations where people won't feel that they're being blamed. And that's key. Because when we have these conversations and we can honestly and openly say to one another, this didn't work. What can we do to be better? We've already moved forward beyond where we were. And I think as we move forward with this collaboration, that capacity for leadership will be built within the classrooms, through resource teachers, through the teachers, through everyone. And we have to understand that the vertical and horizontal articulation has been occurring. Mm -hmm. But you know, I want to thank Mr. Whiston and Dr. Shankman and Dr. Chokel because they gave us those opportunities at general admin and in the administrative meetings to start those conversations. And then I want to thank all the principals that are part of the collaboration <laughs> because they have used their resources and their time and the teachers have used their time and their resources to come together and continue these conversations. So, and to, 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 to close, you know, I want to give a shout out to Mike because co-teaching, through this program, co-teaching will help us find even more success for our district. Because when you have model classrooms and you have two teachers in the classroom, forget their certifications, they're teachers. And they're co-teaching in that classroom and there are 30 kids in that classroom and every, in those two co-teachers are reaching every student, no matter their special education or not, that's going to improve our instruction and that's going to help us. And this collaboration will do that. And my final piece of anecdotal data is this. Kelly didn't want to tell the story, but I will tell the story. A Dearborn Public School graduate is at the University of Michigan Dearborn completing or working on her special education certification. So she emailed and said, can I come in and interview one of your special education teachers? I said, definitely. So I said, you know, what a better person than Kelly. So I asked Kelly, in the conversation, this former Dearborn Public School teacher, who hopefully one day will be an employee of our district, said to Kelly, I was never aware there was a special education program. Kelly asked her and said, but what about when you had co-taught classes? The student said, I just thought it was just two teachers working together. Ultimately, that's the goal. We want to establish model classrooms. We want to establish model classrooms so that teachers within the building have places to go and observe things happening, as well as high school teachers going to elementary, going to the middle, and vice versa. I really believe that through this collaboration, we can continue moving in the right direction, and hopefully we continue to close those gaps. We have a, we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of bumps in the road. We've had a lot of bumps in the road, but it's part of the process. So I thank you. Questions from the board? I, I really appreciate the fact of the different levels working with one another. I think mm -hmm. it makes the whole program much stronger for the students. And as you say, um, that's how you find out, is it working? Is what we've been doing at that level working? You know, when they go on to middle school and you can address it right away. So I think that's probably one of the strengths of the whole program is um, 
the transitions working together and I applaud you for that. Thank you. Pam, thank you. Trustee Berry. A great concept and great presentation. Uh, uh, my question is, as a high school principal, okay, uh, what kind of uh, cooperation are you getting from the principals at the elementary level? I, I know you I understand what you said, no blame game, just trying to get everybody on board, but what kind of cooperation are you getting? You know, in the, in the first year of it, there were a lot of bumps in the road because there was a concern that, you know, uh, you know, is, is one group going to take over or force another group to do something? But through the conversations, it really eased up. Mm -hmm. And that whole idea of, you know, I'm going to take, take it a step back. When, when we as a district started asking teachers to stop working in isolation, there was pushback. Because, you know, a lot of times people are afraid that someone's going to come in and try to tell them what to do. Through our conversations, we have e we as a group those fears have been eased and it's really nice because you know in the conversations i'm having with the principals they have been very open to the idea that we need to have these conversations and when we get together and we discuss different things there are many more ideas that come out uh prime example oakman elementary uh Radwan said to me hey you know, I think it would be a great idea. And I said, what is it? We need more kids at Oakman from Fortson. Great idea. So the conversations have grown. And the conversations have become very collegial. And is there always going to be a fear that someone is trying to push something upon someone else? There's always that fear. But I will be perfectly honest with you. This year has been a very smooth transition compared to past, the, the last year and a half. And I think it's because we've had those conversations and we've had those open and honest conversations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I know, I know the argument that you just can't pay attention to the assessment scores, okay? Uh, but again, as the high school principal, and you know, you're getting these kids and you can, you know, you can trace them back to which middle school, elementary school. Uh, what kind of data are you looking for? I mean, uh, once, let's say the incoming, incoming ninth graders this year, this particular year, and uh, after the first semester, you get X amount percentage at flunk three or four classes. And you start peeling back to find out where they, where, where they came from. Okay, what kind of data are you looking to bring to the next meeting? Specifically, we look at SRI data, Scholastic Reading Inventory. We look at the Lexile math scores. We look at MEEP data. Um, in the next meeting, we're gonna be a much more of a data breakdown and analysis. Uh, we also, the other thing that's very important about this is when we look at the MEEP scores and the MEEP data and we compare that to MME scores, there is a disconnect. That disconnect is because it's two different kinds of tests. So last year we started the conversation and we're going to continue that conversation this year with looking at the SBAC style common assessments because as time goes on, that MEEP is going to go away and it's going to be SBAC style across the board. So we're trying to look at what is it that the students are being tested on the MEEP in reference to how is that being referenced to the MME and to plan and explore. So we look at that data, but at the same time, we also have the conversations of trying to look at as much as possible the whole child. Because there are, a lot, there are occasions where students may not truly be represented by what the data is saying from those assessments. And therefore, we have that conversation. You know, so when we, when we talk to schools and the data says that a, a child is struggling in reading or math, well, we ask the question, what interventions has this child had? Are those interventions working? Where was this child? Now, the other thing about the data, too, is let's take SRI, for example. This, it's a scholastic reading inventory. It could be a, there could be a possibility that a child scores, you know, two grades below reading level when they took the test. But if we don't look back far enough, we may not be able to see that child actually grew two grade levels. They're still behind, but they actually grew. So then the conversation goes to the next level. So let's say that child's going to middle school. So what can we do to make that transition better for that child from elementary to middle school to continue that growth? So we look at that, qua that quantitative data right there, and that, that does lead a lot of our discussions. Because we understand that quantitative data is the growth measure that the state uses, and we can't ignore that. But we don't want to just focus on that. We want to try to get as much as possible from the whole child. 
I like your answer because yeah, you, you can't ignore it because at the end of the day, that's what we're getting measured by. Mm -hmm. right? So exactly. Great. Thank you very much. Good luck to you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Thank you very much and good luck. Thank oh. you. Just real quick, I wanted to comment. I really like what was stated. Um, you're giving a student a toolbox full of strategies that they can continue to use throughout um, their careers in education because I think it's so important for them to feel familiar with what they're doing and that just will, I do believe, close those gaps. I've seen this before. I know how to handle it. So I love it. That is, that is hopefully we're going to we're going to keep doing as much as we can and we're going to adjust as needed but yep. thank you thank you you have been doing this longer than the other two high schools correct yes 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 and they're just beginning the process are they coming to you for oh yeah we have discussions oh definitely i have discussions good. with them and and we do and you know we're finding that you know our needs are very similar i bet they are there are some yeah. areas where there's more of a focus needed than other areas <laughs> but there's similar needs and the great thing about Dearborn, Dearborn Public Schools right now is there is that collegiality. Yeah. I do see it. And there is a lot more conversations happening across the district. And it's, it, we're not separating things. In, I mean, it's more, hey, we're in this together. What can we do to help one another? And that's the ultimate goal. And it streamlines the whole thing for, for everyone. It does, definitely. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. Action items. Special consideration of an action item. Are there any agenda items on this agenda where the where board, which board members or the superintendent wish to discuss and vote on separately? If so, we we'll have some them. supplements to the HR. Yes, there are supplements. Mm -hmm. I don't see any that require a roll call vote. Are there any that uh, anyone wants to pull separately? Mm -hmm. Recommended action, move that action items numbered one through five, including the supplements, be recommended and in this agenda. So moved. Support. Are there any questions or comments to any of those items? Hearing none, we will attach a unanimous affirmative roll call. Summary of agenda action items. Number one, approval of warrants, which are items for payment by the district and have been reviewed by the administration. Number two through four, approval of non-instructional and instructional personnel items for P12. Number five, approval of donations. Next item. Next item is discussion items. Number A, or the first one mm -hmm. is resolution opposing open carry firearms in school, board report 1366. So we will have a resolution coming up uh, opposing that. Uh, we had a draft which we made some changes to in committee today, and so that will be coming forward and we're making sure our policies are aligned to that resolution. So um, look for more information on that. And thank you, Trustee Lane, for, for bringing mm -hmm. this up. I believe I forwarded everyone an email that I received from uh, Trustee in Ypsilanti, encouraging. Yes, mm -hmm. they had done. Who happened to be a teacher in Dearborn yes, and a school yes. board member in Ypsilanti. In Ypsilanti. Mm -hmm. So I was very glad to say that we were having this discussion mm -hmm. and that uh, we would be having a resolution of our own. Isn't it precipitous that uh, today was Sandy Hook's yeah. report day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once again, I thank Ms. Lane for yeah. bringing that up. It's so necessary. It's almost a no-brainer. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, why we're even having to have this discussion is, is really kind of silly if you think about it. Well, I hear they don't have much going on in Lansing these days. So. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a Nick catalog a T-shirt. Oh, how did it say? Those that can teach, those that can't legislate or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Enough said. <laughs> Next item. <laughs> Construction manager and architect bid process, Mr. Brian Whiston, Sam, Mr. Samuel Barna, and Mr. Jeff Bjork. Yeah, very quickly, we did uh, last week interview construction managers, and you will remember that we asked six firms to bid, five did. Those five firms came in, and we, uh, the board and administration, board subcommittee and administration, sat in this room and interviewed those uh, five firms. We then debriefed afterwards and a recommendation will be coming forward on one of those firms. Uh, tomorrow we are meeting with the architect firms. We'll be following the same format. 
We'll be interviewing the architect firms uh, and then making a recommendation. So we hope to bring those recommendations to you. I think it's the December 9th meeting. And uh, so we're on track to do that. Perfect. Very excited to move the process forward for both construction manager and architect. Uh, as you know, we're looking to go out uh, to the financial markets uh, January 13th, 14th uh, to sell the bonds. And so, uh, again, if, if we fat, in fact do sell them, then we'll be working on a time schedule for construction and uh, having a document so that the board and the community can go online and see the dates that were promised and the budgets for each of the projects so everybody can see whether we're on track both time frames and budget wise so very exciting uh, opportunities and we'll look forward to further reports is the expectation that we will be able to actually start working next summer oh yes and we At have least. about i think it's a i think all the firms agree mm -hmm. a two and a half year okay. construction okay time frame mm -hmm. so uh, we hope to have everything completed within the two and a half year time frame mm -hmm. so very good it is exciting mm -hmm. it is anxious for it to get started mm -hmm. good well good luck with the universe tomorrow next item acknowledgement of correspondence i think we've all received the same things i haven't got anything individually next item Board of Education Affairs, Board Member Committee, and Organization Reports. Committee. We had a policy committee meeting. We discussed three items. Let me whip them out so I can remember. Um, one of the items was um, regarding a student and wanting to take the ACT this December. Um, I don't think it's necessary to get into the details of that, but if anybody wants information, we can um, provide that. Uh, but we did approve or did give the administration the go-ahead to to go ahead with I was it. curious about that whether it could be um, they could take the test yep. uh, in a separate timeline yeah they actually did take the test so Good. well and it has to do with our graduation requirement because we require the MME as part of the graduation requirement and so this would substitute the MME for the ACT test and so that's what the question was about okay um, so the timing was such that they could take the MME the ACT. I'm the AC, sorry. The they ACT. could take, take the, the ACT, ACT but they won't the be MME. here to take the MME okay. because they'll be graduating in January, and, and the MME isn't the given until yep. until March. Very good. So I'm glad we were able to accommodate that. Yes, whatever's in the best interest mm -hmm. of the students. Yeah, exactly. I think it's important to be flexible that way. Um, the other issue was regarding. Um, changing the curriculum or getting um, not necessarily changing it but adding to the curriculum for the marketing classes at um, Dearborn High to include um, economics and the training that will go along with it to deliver the Michigan Merit curriculum with regard to economics. Um, it's training that's offered for free and even the substitutes that are used while the, te the two teachers are being trained is paid for. Um, so it's at no cost to the district and it gives our students another option um, to fulfill the economics requirement um, for high school graduation. Am I speaking out of class? Uh, right now. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, and you see this in a lot of, uh, you know, Michael Berry type programs where you're teaching math in the content area. And so this is not an unusual thing that we're recommending. And it actually, I think, um, will overall will enrich the classes for the students. It'll give them a, a broader perspective and um, show the linkage between um, two concepts, you know, marketing and economics, and how they are linked together by teaching them at the same time. So. Is Dearborn High the only high school that has the marketing class? Were they both Dearborn High? They were both Dearborn High. Yep. Yep. Those are the teachers that are asking for it. So I think they, Dearborn High has a focus of it, though. Mm -hmm. They have a, a pretty rigorous program for yeah, they, Business Academy. Yeah, they've had that for a long time. Yeah, they have. They've yeah. had a very good marketing program. So, And this was an initiative that was driven by the two teachers. Um, so hats off to them for taking the initiative to mm -hmm. enhance the students' curriculum. Yeah, I would assume if there's interest at the other buildings that... We would also accommodate them. Good. And the last issue that we discussed was the we reviewed our weapons policy to make sure that it was sufficient, um, considering the changes that are are looking to be made. And 
Um, there's just a little bit of cleanup that may have to happen just um, because one of the, there are three policies, one is regard to employees, one is in regard to students, and the third is in to visitors um, within the buildings. And one of the policies references state law, and so that may need to be updated as that's more clarified. Um, while legally we may not be able to stop someone from bringing a weapon to school, we can make it a violation of our um, board policy, which could in turn lead to them being banned from our buildings, um, which then could turn into you know, trespassing if they continue. Um, as a policy committee, we discussed whether or not it would, if it would have teeth or not, but I think that regardless of if it has teeth or not, I think it's important that we as a district take a stand. Um, too many students and children are being affected by this, and um, you know, they're just last week in the newspaper was an article about a 14-year-old who was shot because he had a toy weapon, mm -hmm. and the police didn't know that it was a toy. He brandished it, and they shot him. Um, it's a scary world that we live in, but the fact of the matter is, is that you know, kids are being killed because of toys, mm -hmm. and it's just as dangerous to bring a toy weapon into school as it is to bring a weapon into a real weapon into school. So, I think that our policy is very. Um, comprehensive I think it covers everything I think it's very clear I think that we've stated this policy we've gone above and beyond I know that at the elementary level that all all parents had to sign um, an acknowledgement of our weapons policy you know we're doing what we can to educate people but I think this is an important firm stand for us to take and the three policies are in agreement I mean they don't yes conflict one another no no not that I saw except for the one the one for visitors did reference, you know, state law that establishes a weapons-free school zone, and so we just need clarification on that if, if that is um, in conflict with the law. But that's something that can be easily remedied by removing. Their policies can't conflict with state law. Right. Yeah. Okay. Did I miss anything? Thank you. Any other committees meet? You've reported. Next item. Uh, board member commentary. No comments today? No comments. Next oh, item. One real quick. I was going to say we're all comments <laughs> out. <laughs> Real quick, happy Thanksgiving to everyone, and I just want to say I came from earlier from the Whitmore Bowls. I mean, I'm sorry, the empty mm -hmm, bowls. Empty bowls. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much to Park Place for putting on that event or helping us put on that event, and all the students that were involved. It's uh, and our very art good. teachers. And it's a lot of work. Teachers, yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, the proceeds go to Gleaners, and this time of year, I think it's important to mm -hmm. for us to let our children know and our students know how important it is to to give because a lot of us are. And better to positions than others. So oh, that's it. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was had to miss that. I had a couple of commitments this afternoon, but I've always gone to it. I, I agree, that's a very worthwhile project. Mm -hmm. And I always buy something. Yeah, I have a collection <laughs> on my desk, <laughs> plaques on my walls, mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. that. I love it. It's very good. Trustee Shells. Um, Today I had the opportunity to go speak at a political science class at HFCC, oh. and. Um, I thought it was interesting the questions that that they were asking we got on the conversation of bonding and you know um, I guess it made me feel really old actually because I didn't think that our last bond was that long ago and yeah. when they had asked about you know well what did it did we build new buildings or you know what did we do with this and I explained that you know we added on to all three of the high schools you know built some extra buildings and stuff and two of the students were Dearborn schools graduates and um, they were like quizzing me on what part of the building was new because they didn't know one of them was Dearborn High um, and the other was Edsel Ford. And so I was there. trying to explain, mm -hmm. right, and that's what she said to me. She's like, wow, really? I didn't know that it wasn't always there. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that whole hallway, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, was brand new. But I thought that it was interesting to bring up that I think it is important that um, that we let the public know with this bond, you know, what this what this entails. and. While we're, you know, we eat, sleep, and breathe this, and so we know every single little detail, and so we just assume that the general public knows that, and I think it's important to let them know what their, what their money is being spent on. And um, agreed, I agree. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that just kind of goes to show what I thought. It was like, wow, really? You didn't know that we worked? We worked really hard for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you just thought it was always there. So, but it was, it was a great conversation and a great opportunity for me. So hopefully they got something out of it, but I did. Good. Very good. Any other? Um, Next item. Request for information and or future agenda items. I know, Amy, you asked us for some data that we'll get yes. you. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> yep. Just want to officially state that. Next item. Superintendent's reports, personal commentary. Well, we're in a situation where I know that Abe is going to be holding a hearing that may or may not lead to an expulsion. And I know our December 9th meeting is our only meeting. So I, even though we're not, we're, I think we ought to call for the meeting because don't you we have can to always vote cancel on that. It. So I think I need to ask you to call for an expulsion hearing on Monday, December 9th. And then if we don't get to that point, we can cancel it. But I think I'd rather have you call for it to be prepared. Would it be a closed session or? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an expulsion, it would be. Unless they have open. We would start off closed and right. it mm -hmm. would be their choice to, right. to open it. Do we have a motion? I motion to um, schedule a closed session for section, is it 8, 8E? Know if any it's of either us 8C or 8E of the Open Meetings Act. The purpose of the meeting Close being an expulsion. expulsion. At six o'clock. Six o'clock. Thank you. December mm -hmm. 9th. Mm -hmm. Support. We will need a roll call for that. Yes. Uh, Trustee Berry. Yes. Trustee Guido is absent. Mary Lane. Yes. Uh, Roxanne McDonald. Yes. Amy Shellis. Yes. James Schoolmaster. Yes. And President Adams. Yes. That's it all. If it's I have, not necessary, then we'll, we'll cancel let it. Us we cancel right. it. Thank you. Any other? No other? Okay, next item. Future meeting dates Monday, December 9th, 6 o'clock. Uh, P12 special, special meeting closed. <laughs> um, Monday, December 9th, 2013, P12 Board of Education meeting, 7 p.m. at the Administrative Service Center in the Frank Franchi Boardroom. Monday, December 16, 2013, HFCC meeting, 7 p.m. at the Andrew Mazzara Service and Conference Center in the Rosno Boardroom, Henry Ford Community College. Monday, January 13, 2014, P P12 Board of Education organizational meeting, 6.45 p.m. at the Administrative Service Center in the Frank Franchi Boardroom. Monday, January 13, 2014, P12 Board of Education meeting, 7 p.m. at the Administrative Service Center in the Frank Franchi Boardroom. Monday, January 21st, 2014, HFCC meeting, 7 p.m. at the Andrew Mazzara and Service and Conference Center in the Rosano Boardroom, Henry Ford Community College. Uh, Ms. Scholes, I think that uh, the January 21st meeting might be a Tuesday because of Martin Luther Ooh, King Day. Oh, you are right. Oh, do we have it as a Monday? Mm -hmm. So is it's the, listed as Monday, but is the 21st a Tuesday? it gives us the right date, but not the right day. Yeah. I presume. Thank you. So Tuesday, January 21st. I think that that's correct. It is to Tuesday. It is, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good catch. Mm -hmm. I just uh, noticed in my calendar, we currently for the ninth have a building in sight at 6 and the finance at 6.30, but we'll we work will work on that. I don't think we need the building in sight. I don't know if we'll need a finance, so we'll have to find Well, out. are we going to have a report um, from our auditors? Yes. So we'll... So we should have a building or a finance committee meeting before yeah. the we auditors may have to report. Put well, then you could do it at 5.30. You can mm -hmm. do that before the closed session. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. In case there's any questions. So for those, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are those meetings committees. Can be so yeah, those, those meetings are, are subject to Even change, just for your information. Pay attention. We'll confirm that. Okay. Right. Thank you. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm. So it's a